Okay. Hello. Good morning and uh, good evening. Uh, I am P.Y. Cho and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Junior Tu, we both will moderate the webinar today. And uh, thank you for coming again to ICC webinar. Today, Professor Derek Stambecker is a board certified fellowship trained plastic surgeon, former director of the CLEP and the Corneal Facial Program, and the former chief of maxillofacial osmotic surgery at Yale. Besides, Professor Stambecker is active at the American College of Surgeons and a member of Rhinoplasty Society and the Society of Plastic Surgeons and the Society of the Maxillofacial Surgeons. Professor Stan Baker has over 230 research papers and the publications, especially in our first ranking journal, PRS. In the recent one decade, Dr. Stan Baker has tons of publications in the field of orthodontic surgery to share his knowledge and the experience to teach us to pursue the excellence. Professor Stan Baker has given over 500 more presentations and invited lectures all over the world. In 2019, Professor published a book entitled with Aesthetic Orthodontic Surgery and the Rhinoplasty. And today, this is exactly the topic Professor come to share, orthodontic surgery, nasal change, and the rhinoplasty. Three panelists invited to come for the panel discussion. Professor Frank Chen from Chang'an Memorial Hospital, Professor Watanabe from Tokyo Metropolitan Police Hospital, and Professor Sale from Busan National University Hospital. So today's webinar later will follow by Professor Stan Baker's the presentation, and the later come with the panel discussion and end up with our QA section. Of course, don't forget our group photo. So can wait and uh, Professor Stan Baker, please. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, everyone, for joining today and for inviting me for this uh, lecture. Um, can everybody see my screen, the full screen, uh, Dr. Cho? Yes, no problem. Perfect. Well, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the nasal deformity and how that relates to orthognathic surgery and rhinoplasty. These are my disclosures that include the book uh, that was mentioned that I'll draw some of the material from today, uh, but also some grants and some instruments. And as background, as we know, you know, nasal changes and the nose and orthognathic surgery and jaw surgery are sort of interrelated and there's a lot of changes that occur um, with orthognathic surgery related to the nose and today the things that I really wanted to address is how number one how does the nose change following orthognathic surgery in particular Lafort movements number two can you predict or assess when a rhinoplasty may be needed um, following orthognathic surgery, and that's always the appropriate sequence, is that it should be done after orthognathic. And if you do do a rhinoplasty, should it be done at the same time, or should it be in a staged fashion? And number three, what are some of the common rhinoplasty techniques or maneuvers that we find useful to address the nose following orthognathic? Because there are some conserved uh, issues or morphologic changes that can occur that we want to be able to address. So by way of introduction, we know that the nasal deformity and the dental facial deformities are interrelated, and it's sometimes the chicken or the egg type phenomenon, but we know that nasal obstruction can lead to jaw deformities, and then also people with jaw or maxillary hypoplasia can have nasal obstruction and nasal deformities as well. We know that these are really interrelated. We also know that when we do orthognathic surgery, it can change the nose and sometimes it changes it uh, for the better, but sometimes it can change it for the worse or we can create or accentuate a nasal deformity. Um, these are the three frequent things that we can see. There can be an intrinsic nasal deformity that's actually improved with Lafort, or there can be an intrinsic nasal deformity that's the same or worsened with Lafort. 
and or the worst case scenario is probably when we create a nasal deformity following a, a Laporte osteotomy. <clears throat> In these two scenarios, uh, we know that frequently a rhinoplasty may be needed. Either we've created or caused a deformity or we've worsened uh, an intrinsic deformity, so we may consider a rhinoplasty in these two situations. But I think, you know, the first to set the stage, uh, we really need to know and understand how does uh, Lafort osteotomy change the nose and, and what, what are the predictable sets of morphologic changes that can occur following orthognathic. But this has been an interest uh, of mine for several years now. We've looked at this in many morphometric and 3D assessments. But we know that by performing the Lafort, we're degloving uh, the tissue around the piriform. We're coming near the anterior nasal spine. We're changing the alveolus. We know that this is changing the lip and nose morphology. And this is going to change the nose. Most of the studies, at least when we first started looking at this 10 years ago or so, looked at two-dimensional radiographs and really just looked at a single piece straightforward advancement without really much 3D data. And there was little or no data available related to impaction, disimpaction, changing of the occlusal plane, et cetera. So one of the first studies we did was to look to three-dimensionally document the nasolabial changes following Lafort. Um, the initial study was looking at a single piece uh, versus multi-piece versus doing uh, surgically assisted maxillary expansion without any impaction, lengthening, no clefts or confounding variables in these procedures. <clears throat> we used a 3D camera and photogrammatic uh, analysis with a series of nasolabial anthropometric measurements and greater than a year follow-up. And this just demonstrates or illustrates some of the um, anthropometric points that we choose and that we looked at before and after um, orthognathic. So we looked at 92 images, slightly more females, uh, older age teenagers uh, was the mean age. And then we, to summarize some, some of the findings that we had, um, the frontal nasal or the nasal frontal angle decreased in all of these um, subgroups. So with the single piece Lafort segmental with advancement and surgically assisted maxillary expansion, the nasal frontal angle decreased. The nasal labial angle, because the tip would turn up to some extent, would increase uh, in a single piece Lafort, in a segmental Lafort with advancement, but would stay unchanged in a maxillary expansion. Nasal tip advancement, interestingly, if you look back in an absolute perspective from the tragus, the nasal tip would increase. But if you look um, from the position of subnasally uh, or the lip position, that nasal distance would actually decrease. Uh, the nostrils would also change. They would go from more uh, upright or vertical to more uh, horizontal. Um, in most of these settings, so wider, more horizontal nostrils. The columella would buckle a bit from a lateral view, so there'd be a greater alar columellar disproportion. The columella would come inferior or down towards the lip margin in any of these instances where, where we would advance, and that includes projection of the columella. <clears throat> this is very common that everybody recognizes that the ALAR base width increases with advancement, and it would do so more when we're widening the Lafort as well. And these are just some examples of this where the nostrils are going from um, more vertical to more uh, wide and horizontal. The ALAR base is widening, and that distance from subnasality to the nasal tip is decreasing. The transverse filtral distance or the mouth width would also increase as you would expect with an advancement. The labial superioris or the subnasally point would also increase whenever we're advancing but would not really change in a maxillary expansion alone. So the conclusions from this first paper uh, from a three-dimensional perspective is that um, the nasolabial changes would occur with Lafort advancement and transverse expansion create uh, some of the more significant nasolabial changes in each uh, Lafort one subtype seems to generate a predictable soft tissue response. 
but we know most of the time we're not just doing a straightforward advancement, though we are sometimes, but frequently we're looking at clockwise and counterclockwise changes or impaction and disimpaction. So we wanted to look at how that would influence it as well. So we looked at another group splitting this into uh, clockwise versus counterclockwise, changing the occlusal plane, anterior impaction, um, to see how this would change it as well. And not surprisingly, doing counterclockwise with anterior impaction or vertical shortening uh, under the piriform would result in the most significant changes, especially related to alar base width and mouse width. Um, it also caused a greater amount of labial superioris projection. <clears throat> um, and uh, clockwise movements did not create as much uh, significant difference, but did have some changes with alar base width and nostril height. And you can see how the uh, nostrils have widened to some extent, uh, and the alar base width has widened as well. So taking both of these papers together, the summary of the nasolabial changes, and you know, we want to take this into consideration with most uh, Lafort patients preoperatively, is that the nasolabial angle will increase, so the tip rotation will increase to some extent. The nasal tip projection absolutely uh, increases from the tragus, but there's a relative decrease. So sometimes that appreciation of the nasal position looks less from subnasally the alar base widens and the nostrils go from more vertical to more horizontal. Counterclockwise leads to more significant alar base and mouth widths uh, and uh, decreases the nasolabial angle or doesn't increase it as much as some of the other advancements. And a summary of this kind of pictorially uh, here, this is taken from the book, uh, just shows how the different subtypes of Lafort movements can change the nose. So that's sort of the, the background or basis. And then, you know, we want to use or harness that information to understand when we might be able to improve the nose and um, when we might need a rhinoplasty. So this was the first step is understanding how does the nose change with orthognathic. And then the next uh, piece that we want to look at or understand is when uh, is a rhinoplasty needed. So again, this is the summary of uh, some of the changes. And uh, a lot of times we can harness these changes to help prevent or improve the nasal uh, form following orthognathic. So we looked at a series of uh, cases as well and showed uh, in some situations, no rhinoplasty is needed. And this is because either there's no intrinsic deformity and we've either improved the nose or that uh, deformity has remained unchanged. So here's a situation with a double jaw surgery, some counterclockwise, but the movement at the piriform was so little um, that there's been no change in the nose. There's really no nasal deformity before surgery, and the nose looks just as good, if not better, after orthognathic. Similar situation here, where um, the amount of movement at the piriform and subnasally, if anything, just enhanced the position of the nose, and no rhinoplasty was needed. <clears throat> There's some other situations that I think this is the most favorable when, because of these morphologic changes that we can expect, um, you know, we can make the nose actually look better. Um, so not just unchanging the nose, but actually making it look better. And this is when there's a small dorsal hump that can improve, when maybe the alar base is too narrow to begin with, and by advancing, we can widen it in a favorable fashion. Or if the tip looks too projected and droopy by advancing, uh, we can actually turn it up a little bit, like in this example shown here. So no rhinoplasty needed if we're able to harness these changes and improve the nose. So here, this uh, more droopy, elongated tip is turned up. Uh, the small dorsal hump uh, has been removed because the lower portion, the lower one third or two thirds of the nose comes further forward and actually creates a little bit of a super tip break. Here's a few other examples like this where no Lafort, or sorry, no uh, rhinoplasty is needed because by doing the Lafort alone, it's been able to create a super tip break, eliminate the hump, widen the uh, alar base to some extent, uh, and turn up the tip, widening the, the nostrils to some extent. Uh, 
a few other examples here where we're able to harness just the Laforte movements to improve the nasal position without needing a rhinoplasty. So the nasal hump is uh, eliminated. There's a slight or subtle super tip break um, or very little change in the extent that we do not need a rhinoplasty. In this case, maybe the alar base is widened a bit um, too much, but um, in that case, a rhinoplasty was not needed. And here is demonstrating this as well. You can see it's almost too elongated of a nasal uh, tip position and the, the nostrils are narrow, slit-like, vertical. The alar base is narrow and after orthognathic, we've been able to widen that some and put this into better proportion. So that's uh, probably the majority of the cases, um, you know, a rhinoplasty is not needed, probably in 60%, 70% of the cases, but in some situations, a rhinoplasty would be favorable, and that's either because when we've done orthognathic, it's over widened the nose or created more of these deformities that we then want to address, and or there's an intrinsic deformity or septal deviation, um, or dorsal hump that does not improve following orthognathic. And there are some common nasal issues in the orthognathic patient. As we alluded to at the beginning, we know that nasal obstruction can lead to VME and other dental facial deformities. We know that there are some intrinsic issues that can present in some of these patients with septal deviation, mid-vault uh, collapse or narrowness or asymmetry, wide alar base that becomes wider, the tip form is not really addressed by orthognathic. And uh, in cases like this, um, this uh, Cruzan patient, her nasal deformity and C-shaped deformity is not going to be expected to improve um, with orthognathic. <clears throat> so it's needed if there's an intrinsic nasal deformity or septal deformity that we're not going to improve um, and or the nasal appearance worsens with the Laforte. And another consideration will be, do we do it at the same time as orthognathic, you know, at the second phase of that one operative episode, or do we complete the orthognathic surgery and come back three, six, eight months later and do the rhinoplasty? So here are some typical areas that we do need to address where the dorsum needs widening because it's narrow, the tip uh, needs increased projection. If there's decreased nasal tip projection to start and then you're advancing the maxilla, it's gonna make that less. That subnasality to tip distance is gonna shorten. And if the alar base is wide to start, it's only gonna widen further. So these are uh, those scenarios again, where rhinoplasty may be needed. Um, we looked uh, at my experience with doing it at the same time versus in a staged fashion. Um, majority female, 68% uh, or 68 patients required a rhinoplasty. My preference is to do it in a staged fashion, but we did do about 18% simultaneously. Um, in the cases that we did simultaneously, some of the factors were that there was no or minimal maxillary surgery. Um, there are some downsides to doing it concurrently. Number one, related to recovery when you have doyle splints or some type of nasal splints in dressing and tight elastics or um, uh, maxillomandibular fixation uh, from a recovery perspective, but also from an anesthesia and a surgery perspective. You know, you start with the nasal tube, you complete the orthognathic procedures, then you have to, with freshly operated jaws, switch from a nasal tube to an oral tube and then complete the rhinoplasty. So there's some technical challenges as well. Uh, not that it's uh, not able to be overcome, but um, you know, my preference is typically to do it uh, in a staged fashion. But here's an example of a simultaneous rhinoplasty. She had BSSO, Genio only, and then rhinoplasty. The cases that I've done it, uh, there's very minimal change at the pure form. Um, and I think from that perspective, you can better predict how you want to change the nose. Here's another example where she had counterclockwise movement um, and had rhinoplasty at the same time. But my preference is really to do it in a staged fashion. I think there's some other advantages too in that if patients want to have plates removed uh, or if you really want to be able to predict or build that nasal tip projection, 
you can better assess and judge after you've allowed the tissue around the piriform to settle and mature. Um, so about 82, 85% of my cases, I'll do it in a staged fashion, you know, anywhere from three months to six, eight months uh, later, there's no exact time frame. Um, but you can see in a patient like this, if anything, it just made her nasal deformity worse, but you give it time and allow this to um, mature and settle. And then you can decide how much nasal projection is needed and uh, if plates need to be removed and other things, you can do that at the same time. But here's a common example. So there's a narrow mid vault to begin with, very long upper lip length to begin with, and a wide alar base. <clears throat> After orthognathic, that just accentuates. The tip turns up even further. Alar base widens. Um, so we need to do a rhinoplasty to turn down the tip, narrow the alar base. This on lateral view, you can see this very obtuse nasolabial angle, a short appearing nose that's only shorter after orthognathic. So turning down or lengthening the nose using septal extension graft <coughs> can help with that. So I'd say these are some of the most common nasal deformities uh, that we find after Lafort. So the mid vault is very narrow. You lose some of that tip projection. Again, if that subnasality to tip uh, distance is already short, it's only going to get shorter. And uh, that tip can over rotate and the alar base will widen to a too extent, uh, too much of a extent. So here, narrow alar base, very uh, under projected tip where the tip is almost plastered to the subnasally, almost like a bilateral cleft. Uh, here an over rotated tip and then a very wide alar base that can accentuate that mid vault narrowing as well. So these are the problems, narrow mid vault that we typically address using spreader grafts or spreader flaps, loss of tip projection where there's a series of graduated ways that we can use uh, lateral curl steel, tip suturing, grafting and support. Alar base widening, uh, we begin by increasing tip projection because of the tripod, um, but we also may need to consider alar base excisions. So beginning with uh, the dorsum, um, spreader grafts are a uh, very common way to help us widen the mid vault, and it'll also help uh, from a breathing perspective and an internal valve perspective as well. Uh, and a lot of this is a visual proportional aspect because when the alar base widens, obviously the mid vault will look narrower as well. But these are typically what we'll do from the septum. You can carve um, spreader grafts, place these on the dorsal septum, and sometimes I'll do this together with uh, spreader flaps as well. And this again will help tighten uh, the mid vault, uh, the upper lateral cartilages, as well as widen the mid vault and improve the breathing. So a wide alar base, a narrow mid vault that uh, is put into better proportion. And here she is, she's a um, vertical maxillary excess patient with uh, steep occlusal plane, <clears throat> nasal deformity and obstruction that is corrected first with orthognathic surgery, impaction, counterclockwise movement, and then um, rhinoplasty techniques. Relating to tip projection, um, this can be challenging, but it always begins with a graduated approach where you're really tightening the lower lateral cartilage using lateral curl steel, where you make the dome from more lateral uh, on the lateral cruise. Uh, that's the first step, and then using some type of either collimelar strut or septal extension graft, sometimes with tip or infralobular grafts as well to improve or increase that tip projection. So I prefer septal extension grafts because this can be nice and firm and stable down to the anterior nasal spine and you can really support the tip up to that septal extension graft. And this is another reason I like to do it in a staged fashion because at the time of Lafort, you've either separated the posterior septal angle from the anterior nasal spine, or you've come underneath the spine, but that support at the anterior nasal spine is the most critical to establishing your tip projection, and it's not well established or supported at the time of a Lafort. So I like to wait for that to be um, more stable, more rigid. Then once the septal extension graft is put in place, you can create your domal elements, 
and suture these to the septal extension graft. And here we always want the caudal edge of the lateral crus to be more everted than the uh, cephalic edge. Sometimes we'll uh, trim the caudal septum as well. And this is demonstrating some lateral curl steel where those blue marks are not at the point of the native dome, but slightly lateral. Uh, and by tightening this, we're able to establish a little bit more tip projection um, in placing an everted uh, suture. Uh, you can also evert that aspect of the lateral cruise. So again, we want the caudal extent of the lateral cruise to be more averted and the cephalic margin to be less averted. Here now is placing a septal extension graft and this can be placed either on the one end or another of the caudal septum <clears throat> or it can be placed end on and two extended spreader grafts can be used to hold that in position. Lastly, uh, after the whole tripod elements are brought back um, to the midline, we can place an infralobular tip graft if needed for additional tip projection. Uh, but we really start at the base, making sure the posterior septal angle is firm and supported with a septal extension graft using uh, lateral curl steel, recreating the tripod and using tip grafts as needed. So situations like this to increase nasal uh, labial angle as well as tip projection. And these are some challenging cases where it's uh, a bender type patient with nasal maxillary hypoplasia where before any surgery, the nasal tip is already under projected, a very wide alar base. Um, in the setting of maxillary hypoplasia, both vertically and sagittally. So after orthognathic, as the middle picture shows, it just makes it worse. So these are cases we really need to build that tip up and, um, and do it in the techniques described. So again, you can see pre-op before orthognathic in the middle picture after orthognathic, but the nose looks worse. Um, and then after rhinoplasty as well. Here on the other side, after rhinoplasty as well. So this is um, some of the more challenging cases because you really need to stretch that skin and skin envelope. And I don't think that would be a good uh, situation to do simultaneous with orthognathic. Another similar example, uh, after orthognathic, you can see how the nose looks worse. The nostrils are horizontal and, and almost closed. The soft triangle is almost to the base of the sill. And so we really need to stretch that out. And sometimes you need to do techniques to almost like a bilateral cleft to increase collumellar length with VW plasties and, and other techniques to try to get enough skin to be able to stretch out the, uh, the tip itself. But here she is uh, after orthognathic. And if you don't think about the nose, you know that's gonna look worse. And then after orthognathic and rhinoplasty. So it's really the icing on the cake. You know, we don't wanna stop with just the orthognathic, but these patients really need rhinoplasty as well. <clears throat> and we have uh, a few videos related to this uh, referenced here where uh, this one patient is shown from uh, the initial presentation through the orthognathic intraoperative to the rhinoplasty intraoperative all the way to the, the final results. So if you're interested, please uh, check out that video. <clears throat> and I alluded to this a little bit already, but um, the first step, you know, when somebody has a widened ALR base after orthognathic is to first begin with tip projection. So you don't always need weir or uh, alar base excisions if by increasing tip projection that in and of itself is gonna bring in the alar base. It's not always enough, but this kind of borrows from the tripod uh, theory that if you increase the nasal tip, uh, you're gonna be able to narrow um, the alar base to some extent. So here's a case uh, on top is before orthognathic. On bottom here is after orthognathic, so you can see how it's worsened things. Again, that mid vault looks more narrow, even though it hasn't really changed. It's really just a visual uh, proportional thing because the ALR base has widened so much. Uh, but I'll show her case later. She needed tip projection, but also weir and sill excisions. And you know, you may ask, or, or many people, many of us use some of these techniques, such as repair of the muscle coming underneath the anterior nasal spine, 
which I like to come underneath the anteronasal spine more to project protect that posterior septal angle uh, attachment. So when we go back to place a septal extension graft that that's firmed and grafted. But an alar cinch can also maybe help prevent some of the widening, but most of the studies show that it will, uh, regardless of how much you tighten it, this will widen back to some extent with time. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, but this is an issue that we see after Laforte is that uh, there's either excessive nasal flare or alar flare or that alar base width is going to increase. And just placing an alar cinch, one point to, to make is that it will sometimes decrease this intra-alar, alar facial groove distance, but it won't address the flare. And sometimes the flare will actually worsen and, and look abnormal as well. So the uh, skin approaches, if when you've uh, advanced the tip is not enough, include using a wedge approach alone versus if the nostril is too wide at the sill, sometimes we need to extend this into the sill itself and to remove some of that tissue. There's different ways you can design it, such as here, and this is all uh, in the book as well. Um, I like to use proline sutures, but here are some examples of ALAR base and SIL um, approaches where we can narrow this uh, in addition to uh, supporting the ALA. And on the 3D camera is great because you can superimpose the before and after and see the shadow difference of, of how we've changed the ALAR base. And she was not an orthognathic patient, but just to illustrate how to narrow the ALR base and uh, improve the dimensions uh, by using these techniques. So number one, by tip projection, and number two, by base and sill excisions. <clears throat> so this is the patient I showed earlier. You can see how her ALR base has widened and those nostrils are more horizontal. And then this is after rhinoplasty where we've increased projection and narrowed the ALR base. Here's the 3D image. So um, we're able to turn up the tip some. Sometimes um, if there's such a short um, upper lip length, obviously doing a low port's going to improve that, but then turning up the tip after uh, rhinoplasty as well is going to improve that dimension there of the upper lip. One other area to address, um, especially for some of these intrinsic deformities, is thinking about the dorsal hump and how to correct that. Um, a lot of times with Lafort, as mentioned, it's going to work, it's going to lessen, um, so it may improve, but there are some intrinsic cases where we're still going to need to be able to um, address the dorsal hump. So situations like this, you know, if this is one of the better scenarios where there's a concave profile with a prominent nose. I think the hardest thing to address is a concave profile, maxillary hypoplasia with a small nose, like some of those bender patients we've shown or some of the Asian patients we see that that is more of an issue. The other thing is these deviations, uh, cases like this that have had trauma or intrinsic deviation, that deviation is gonna get worse uh, with a Lafort. <clears throat> but patients like this uh, with a large dorsum, Remember that a small hump alone will improve with Lafort, but if it's a very significant dorsum, you know, we need to incrementally reduce that. These days with piezo, I think that's a really good option. Rasping alone sometimes is an option, but most of the time, some type of osteotomy, and it's frequently a significant amount of the dorsal septum. Very little is bone. A lot of times it's really the dorsal septum. And you can see here that little flick of cartilage is the dorsal septum that we've trimmed. You can place a double guarded osteotome to come underneath there and at the cap um, and remove a combination of bone, upper lateral cartilage, and dorsal septum. And then you can finish off uh, with a series of rasps to smooth this. But remember, whenever you take an apex down further, it's going to widen the dorsum, sometimes excessively. So then those are scenarios when we're going to need to infracture or do nasal osteotomies. <clears throat> Frequently, we're shooting for about a two millimeter super tip break, at least in a, a woman. But remember that it's often that you need about five millimeters from cartilage for it to show up as about two millimeters on the skin. Um, <clears throat> 
And we also need to remember if we're increasing tip projection, don't over lower the dorsum. You have to kind of have in your mind's eye where the tip will end up and establish the dorsum appropriately. <clears throat> Here's just a few examples of setting the tip, then the dorsum um, into the appropriate position. Some men do not want a super tip break like this, and you may say this is slightly more feminizing, um, but that's why I think the 3D camera and simulations can be very helpful in some of these patients to try to establish how much a super tip break, if any, um, they want. But in this female as well, a nice two millimeter super tip break. And again, on the cartilage that uh, relates more to five to seven millimeters. Here's a case with deviation, a dorsal hump as well, where we've uh, lowered the dorsum and maintained or increased the tip projection and established about a two millimeter super tip break, trying to create more of an equilateral triangle underneath as well. Another example where we've refined the tip, smoothed the dorsum and established about a two millimeter super tip break, helped that alar calumellar proportion on lateral view as well. <clears throat> so all these techniques are really needed when uh, we have this persistence of a deformity after orthognathic surgery. And it helps at this very early point before we've even done orthognathic to plant the seed or ensure that they know that their nose is not going to look better and may look worse after Lafort and that they may end up needing a rhinoplasty. I think it's not a good scenario to do the orthognathic and then say, oh yes, we may need a rhinoplasty. We should try to anticipate that from the get-go before any surgery at all. This girl had a uh, cleft palate um, that's kind of held back her maxilla, uh, maxillary hypoplasia. Her maxilla was advanced. She also had some speech issues afterwards uh, because of the advancement. So at the time of the rhinoplasty, you can also do pharyngeal flaps or uh, whatever speech surgery you prefer. Here's a patient that had Lyme disease that affected her condyles and she had condylar resorption and a very significant concave, sorry, convex profile with a prominent nose. You can see her nose actually does look a little bit better. Um, the hump looks less, that subnasality, the tip is less, but she still requires a rhinoplasty to put this in better balance. And here she is before any surgery till after counterclockwise <clears throat> genioplasty and rhinoplasty. Just a few comments about profileplasty before um, finishing up. But I think, you know, the other thing, trying to predict how the nose um, changes with Lafort and trying to understand which patients need rhinoplasties and what techniques to use, but another thing to think about is overall profile plasty. And frequently when that term is used, you know, at, at least in a lot of the literature, it's, you know, a chin implant and making the nose smaller. But there, I think there's a lot more to profile plasty than that, as everyone in this audience knows as craniofacial. Um, but there can be a lot of different variations. You know, it's not just making the nose smaller and projecting the mandible, uh, but you can have concave profiles with a prominent nose. You can have concave profiles with a flat nose. You can think about the glabella um, and certain other things, especially with facial feminization surgery. But this is probably the most common scenario uh, and the most common thing that's touted relating to uh, profileplasty is a prominent nose and a recessive chin and trying to put that in better balance. So in a lot of plastic surgery where people are not as comfortable with orthognathic or osseous genioplasty, it's a chin implant and making the nose smaller. But in this audience, obviously it's orthognathic surgery, rhinoplasty, a case like this with counterclockwise orthognathic surgery, rhinoplasty, this case that I showed earlier. Here she is again on lateral. <clears throat> this is another, probably a more favorable uh, profile plasty type scenario where the nose is prominent and there's a concave profile because the nose is going to look a little bit better already after orthognathic, but um, he obviously benefited still from uh, rhinoplasty as a second stage. Another thing to consider is, especially uh, in patients that have a very flat forehead or glabella, is if you're taking this dorsum down, um, 
to me, it looks very abnormal not to have a radix. And you've seen patients that where it goes from the glabella straight to the dorsum, it looks very abnormal. So in these situations, we may wanna consider some type of augmentation of the glabella. I know they make silicone and other implants. In this case, we just did fat grafting to the glabella at the yellow arrow, and now it uh, makes her nose have a clear starting point as opposed to if you had just taken down the dorsum, uh, it would just come flat straight from the forehead down, which I think looks very abnormal. So profile, plasty as well, consider the forehead, consider the radix position uh, as seen here. <clears throat> so in summary, um, I know that's a fair amount of information, but we know the nasal deformity and facial and jaw deformities are interlinked. Based on you know, a lot of the 3D data, we can try to predict how the nasal labial unit will change. Some cases it's gonna be the same or will improve, which is ideal. In some cases, we're gonna create a deformity or the deformity will persist. In those cases where there is a deformity that's created or persisting, we need to consider a rhinoplasty. And uh, we can do it at the same time, but most of the time I prefer to do it in a staged fashion for the reasons described. These are the settings when a rhinoplasty is required. So either we've created a nasal deformity, which we definitely want to counsel the patient and or their family about beforehand, or the nasal deformity that exists, you know, is worsened or persists. The procedures or techniques that we may need to use include spreader graphs, uh, using this graduated approach to achieve tip projection and being very comfortable or facile with alar based modification. Most of the time, uh, like mentioned, I recommend doing this in a staged fashion, uh, mostly to be able to predict how to uh, establish tip projection and how much alar based widening, but also because of some of the logistic challenges in the post-op recovery. Profileplasty should be something we consider as well. Uh, thinking about convex and concave profiles, I think the hardest is uh, something like a bender patient or a patient with a very flat nose with also a flat face because you need to really establish nasal projection on top of the facial projection that you're establishing as well. Thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Chu and every and Dr. Chu and everybody from Chengdung, and uh, I appreciate uh, your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Steinbacher, for the very detailed lecture on um, nasal changes and rhinoplasty after orthodontic surgery. Now, I'd like to invite our panelists for some comments. So first, I'd like to invite Professor Cheng. Professor Frank Cheng, would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Stenbaker. A uh, very nice talk. I think there's a difference between uh, Western and Oriental uh, population. That in our population, we rarely or very uh, unfrequently need osteo uh, nasal dosen osteotomy. Most frequently, we need augmentation. And uh, the difference is also that the widening of uh, ala and the increase of uh, nasal labial angle is always, almost always, uh, resulting in a uh, uh, um, less favorable result. I like some of your population end up with better uh, proportion or better uh, improvement of dorsal hump. So uh, I think that that might be a difference of uh, races. In my hand, uh, I use back grafting to do the augmentation at the same time. So I think it's very different. And uh, I always do a very tight uh, cinch uh, suture. Even the cinch suture might might be loosening by time and the widening a little bit, but if I don't do that, I think the widening might be worse. Uh, and I do have one question. Uh, where do you harvest the cartilage? You do septal ear cartilage or uh, rig cartilage for the US uh, septal extension graft? Yeah, yeah, my preference is to use septal cartilage if possible, but um, 
uh, you know, if that's not available, either a cleft patient or some Asian patients or African American patients may not have enough septal cartilage, then uh, you typically need rib. And there's some off the shelf uh, rib available um, or the patient's own rib uh, as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Very, uh, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cheng. Our next um, panelist is Dr. Watanabe. Professor Watanabe. Yes, uh, good evening, good morning. Uh, Dr. Steinbecker, thank you very much for your nice presentation. I thank have you. also your book. Yes, I love this book. So I have so many uh, uh, a hint on this book. Thank you very much. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Frank Chan mentioned before, so uh, we are, uh, we uh, Asian people uh, mostly, uh, 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 our nose are very uh, low and very weak. So, compare your uh, Caucasian uh, population, uh, we have to be very more careful about. Uh, uh, planning the uh, jaw surgery, especially a maturity uh, uh, position. Uh, we uh, usually, uh, I usually plan the maturity advancement uh, within two millimeter uh, to avoid the uh, nasal deformity after the operation. So in your experience for Asian, uh, operation in your clinics, uh, what is your uh, most important planning point for uh, our uh, Asian uh, races? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. And I think that's sometimes the most challenging because you don't want to advance at the piriform because it'll make the whole bridge disappear. And I have some case examples where there's almost already proptosis and you know you can see that the eye is now in front of actually the bridge so I agree with that and it as much as possible I try to do counterclockwise so there's very minimal movement at the piriform but you can still get a lot of movement at the the chin and pagonion to help open the airway in those types of cases and I think a lot of times it's that vertical distance uh, of the posterior portion of the palate as well that can improve the breathing. You know, a lot of the sleep apnea types of uh, cases, you know, in the old days, people talked about you have to move it forward 10 millimeters, but I don't think that's necessarily true at the pure form. And if you can change the occlusal plane, you know, you can still get a lot of airway benefit with less of a nasal uh, negative effect. So, yeah, that's one thing is trying to limit the amount at the pure form and then, you know, really trying to focus on how to build that bridge up afterwards. And, you know, I know there's a lot of silicone implants and other implants that you can use. I tend to prefer autologous uh, tissue, either from the septum if possible or rib. And depending on the age of the patient, using their own rib versus off the shelf. You know, if it's too young of a patient, the rib tends to warp more. If it's too old of a patient, it tends to be too calcified. So kind of the ideal age for a rib is probably 30 to 50. Uh, but if they're younger than that, you know, maybe off the shelf and older than that off the shelf. But, you know, certainly a dorsal augmentation is, is going to be needed and using septal extension grafts to help lift up the tip as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Watanabe. And uh, our next panelist is Professor Sale. Thank you for the great presentation, Professor Derek Stenbecker. We met in Boston last year. I'm not sure you remember me or not. <laughs> it was at the time very busy and yeah. your lecture was always fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm totally agree with uh, Professor Frank Zhang's mention because there's a big difference uh, about the uh, between the Caucasian and Asian. So, you know that uh, Korean patients are so sensitive for the their aesthetic result. So, in my case of OGS, I routinely emphasize that to the patient that your nose could be getting worse after OGS 
because most of our patients have insufficient tip projection and ALA base, uh, so-called ALA flaring. In, in the preoperative fi pre finding, they, they already have that kind of uh, characteristic feature. So uh, they are so sensitive about the uh, ALA flaring especially. So I routinely uh, uh, emphasize the possibility of the nasal change after OGS to the patient. Yeah. Uh, and I have two questions. Number one is, uh, as I heard that uh, recently for the hump, hump, for the, uh, hump nose collection, preservation line of class is, is quite popular in the westernized people, as, as I know. But uh, in your presentation, you prefer the uh, incremental hump reduction technique you prefer, right? So uh, how do you think about the, the technical difference and your technical preference? Yeah, no, I think piezo is still a good uh, technique to use. And um, if we're using the piezo um, for other things or for the osteotomies, then, you know, I'll also use it for the hump, but I often don't use it if, um, if I'm not using it for the osteotomies. The issue with using the piezo for an open rhinoplasty for the osteotomies is you have to undermine the skin from the dorsal perspective all the way down to the nasal maxillary in order to reach the piezo over there. You know, it's been more and more popular in, in Turkey and other places, the push down, let down uh, type preservation. But in most of these patients, I'm not doing preservation because I'm really trying to increase the tip projection. It's almost like a secondary or revision case. So, um, you know, I'm not always using the piezo, but piezo is very popular for pre preservation where you create, um, you know, tunnels. Um, and things like that, and you push down the existing hump. But for many of these patients, you know, we really need to use structure techniques and tighten the upper lateral cartilages and, and use a lot of grafting to increase tip projection, et cetera. So, um, you know, most of the time I, I use an osteotome still, and I'm using osteotomes for many of the osteotomies, but in some cases we will use piezo. And I think it does have some benefits related to less bruising and swelling and, and recovery and that type of thing. Thank you. And I have asked one more question. Uh, and uh, for the facial asymmetric cases, uh, sometimes we need the uh, mixture mandibular complex shift we need. So in that kind of case, the facial middle and low face asymmetry can be collected, but the nose uh, uh, nasal deviation still uh, persistent. Uh, so uh, in that kind of cases, in your during loop one oste osteotomic procedure, uh, we can easily uh, we, we can easily approach to the caudal septum. So in that kind of cases, do you reposition the caudal septum to the new position of the uh, ANS? Yeah, yeah, that's a good good question. And sometimes it's difficult too to get the midline unless you're using 3D, 3D printed plates, et cetera, but sometimes the nose being very deviated can be uh, a bit of a distraction when you're trying to get the midline on with the radix or glabella if the nose is deviated. But yeah, I typically do try, I come underneath the internasal spine and then I'll suture that to the new position of where the midline is. So at least the posterior septal angle will be at the midline though sometimes the tip will remain deviated and that can be addressed when we come back for the rhinoplasty. Thank you. Thank you. And last, I'd like to invite Professor Lowe. Uh, hi, Dr. Stan Baker. Very interesting uh, topic and i very happy to hear your presentation. Uh, I I do agree with you that uh, when the nose problem is simple, we can do it simultaneously. Uh, however, most of the time we will do it as a stage procedure. Uh, very simple question. I saw you use both hands to do surgery. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, some of the vi um, videos, there was residents and things too, but yeah, I definitely use both hands and I think, you know, being ambidextrous is, but I, I'm left-handed, you know, <laughs> as a left-hander, you have to be good with your right hand too, I guess. Oh, so you're left-handed. I'm, I'm also left-handed. I'm, you, you know, I always tell my fellow and resident that you have to use, you have to learn your left hand. Uh, that that would be e mo most easier. Thank you very much for, for tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
Uh, thank you once again to our all our panelists. And now I'd like to uh, move on to the Q&A session. So uh, first is a question from Dr. Hoaklian. And the question is, will you use the sling suture technique to reduce LR base size after performing Lefort 1 osteotomy? Yeah, so like a cinch. Um, yeah, we definitely use an ALR cinch in most every case, but um, you know, I think they still will widen to an extent. And sometimes like that slide alluded to, you can worsen the flare, which means that you're pulling in the ALR base point. But sometimes if there's too excessive ALR skin, that will still kind of flare out. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I do to try to control excessive widening. Uh, just on the side, um, what type of suture um, material do you use for the cinching sutures? Yeah, I use a uh, braided, uh, non-absorbable, so either a Ethabond or Tycron type thing. I know some people use nylon, but I feel like that's, or, or, or um, you know, eth uh, uh, other types of uh, nylon monofilament, but I feel like that's sometimes very uh, palpable and sharp, so I like the softer braided Tycron or Ethabond. Okay, and um, the second question from Dr. Hoaglian is how do you correct the white hump nose if the patient um, had the OGS at the maxillary? Is it safe to perform osteotomy for the widened nose? Um, yeah, so the one thing to take into consideration is just make sure those piriform plates you don't put them too narrow or too close to where you're going to be making your nasal osteotomies later. Um, obviously, you need to put them where bone is good. And if you go too lateral, you're getting close to the infraorbital nerve and the bone is not as good near the sinus. But just be mindful um, of where you'll be making your osteotomy. And But yeah, I think it's, it's definitely uh, safe, especially uh, later in time. And our next uh, question is from Professor Cho. And the question is, for cases that need further stage rhinoplasty, would you pre prepare the Lefort 1 osteotomy any differently? And also, would there be any difference in cases that need counterclockwise rotation or clockwise rotations? Yeah, so I think what I was talking about in terms of the plates is, uh, is one thing. Um, you know, at the time of or orthognathic, I usually always widen the, the nasal cavity and remove part of the um, septum down on the maxilla, sometimes open the piriform, sometimes um, contour the piriform. I think the piriform also can contribute to alar base widening. And if you can contour it at the same time and put the plates a little bit more lateral, you know, you'll have less bulk underneath the, the ala. Um, you know, we also, I think the important thing is really making sure that posterior septal angle anterior nasal spine is going to heal well in the middle and be stable for the time that you come back for orthognathic. So I come underneath the spine. If there's a big distance because they're significant clockwise, then bone grafting in between. If there's not much of a distance, you know, you need to make sure you, and you're doing counterclockwise, sometimes you need to relieve enough bone because otherwise you can push into the septum and cause some deflection one way or another. Um, but I think those are the, the primary things um, that, that I'll do. And the second question from Professor Joe is that, is there any possibility to perform the rhinoplasty prior to OGS? Yeah, I think it's not a, it's not the best scenario or it's not ideal in, you know, in, Obviously, we do have to do it or see it sometimes. You know, I've seen patients that come that have had already a pre-existing rhinoplasty and then um, require orthognathic, but sometimes they're going to need a rhinoplasty again. I think it's better to always do after because the piriform and the base is going to really change. Um, you know, the alar base and the tip and those types of things. So. You know, I think it's kind of like the analogy I use sometimes for my patients is you want to have the foundation in place first and uh, before you start, you know, building the house on top of it or before you do interior design, you need, you know, the house built and the foundation in place. So I think it's always better to, you know, in a cleft patient, a good alveolar bone graft, then orthognathic and then rhinoplasty. So I think that's the best sequence and will be the best results.
And our last question is from Dr. Kuzuhiro. And the question is, how do you decide the position of the maxilla for the advancement? Yeah, I think that depends on every case, you know, and um, I see a lot of asymmetry cases from condylar hyperplasia. We see a lot of concave profile, convex profile. You know, I look a little bit at the tooth position, but um, you know, a lot of times it's really central, it's really the relationship of the maxilla to the mandible and how that relates to the glabella. So I'm not thinking necessarily on some millimeter advancement or not, it's more the overall proportion uh, of the maxilla to the mandible and um, not over advancing the maxilla. Um, so yeah, I think that, it, I think it's not a one size fits all type answer, but it really is case dependent. And, you know, that brings in some of the creativity that we're able to use in our orthognathic, aesthetic orthognathic planning. And we have one more question from Professor Nyang. The question is, how do you prevent relapse? Yeah, that's, uh, that's also a good question. And, you know, I don't know if we know the answer to that, except for, um, you know, not over advancing things, being careful in uh, cleft patients, especially where there's a tight band of scar on the palate. You know, in cleft patients, sometimes I'll over advance it a, a millimeter or so. Um, I think having a good orthognathic plan, sorry, uh, sorry, orthodontic plan and compliance with elastics postoperatively, um, you know, will relate to that. But, you know, the cases that I think I see more relapse would be the cleft patients. And the way I try to address that is not, you know, do 10 or 15 millimeter maxillary advancements, but really kind of split it between the maxilla and the mandible and give a little bit of excess over jet um, to give the orthodontist more ability to uh, correct things and also account for some of the relapse that could occur. Okay, thank you. And I think that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junior. And thank you, Dr. Derek Steinbeck again for your wonderful talk. Uh, I think this currently orthodontic surgery is very famous and popular, not only in Asia, even in the United States. And I think all of the journal currently receive a lot of uh, this field of the relate, related uh, papers uh, to, to tell us what we can touch, what we could not to touch. So I think all of this kind of uh, paper now is very popular as well. Not only focusing on the two jaw surgery, besides of that, like today's topic, rhinoplasty and uh, how we could do or how we could do it simultaneously or stage. Uh, is all of the, is always a trend. So thank you, Professor Stanback, to provide us so much uh, very wonderful the information. Uh, I think today our audience in ICC learned a lot. Uh, of course, I have to say thank you for today our panelists, Professor Sale, Professor Watanabe, Professor Frank Chen. So at last, I would like to invite all our audience in front of the screen, please turn off your screen with me and uh, please express your smile. I think it's a very, very uh, good time to have so Professor stand back with us. So it's a good photo time. Okay, so please give me a smile and I will come to three. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fayaz. Thank Thank you, Dr. Aiki, Dr. Jordan Stanbecker, and Dr. Honda. Hello, Dr. Saran. Thank you for coming. Oh, Dr. Yan Zhan Xiao. Nice to see you. Okay, I will count to three and please give me a smile. One, two, cheers. And then I will turn to the next page again. Please give me a smile. My second page friend. One, two, cheers. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate for your participation and thank you, Professor Stanbeck, again. And looking forward to your next come and join our panel and our webinar. Good morning and good evening. See you next time. Thank you, Thanks, Professor. Bro. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor Stanbeck. Thank you, Junior. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Professor Frank Chen. Thank you, Watanabe.
Bye 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 bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kazuhiro. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Junior. Today is the time is very economics. Yeah. <laughs> right on time too. <laughs> yeah. And a very good time with all the our friend in ICC. Okay. Yep. Okay. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.